Welcome. In this podcast, we'll discuss atomic absorption spectrometry, or as it's often referred to, AAS. By the end of this podcast, students should be able to explain how atomic absorption spectrometry works, name common two commonly used sampling techniques, and explain how these techniques work and be able to compare and contrast the two methods. Draw a basic block diagram for an atomic absorption instrument and explain how it functions. Define the term characteristic concentration and explain its significance in atomic absorption analysis. And lastly, explain what ICP-OES and ICP-MS are and how these techniques differ from atomic absorption spectrometry. Well, let's get started. Atomic absorption is a very versatile analytical technique used in the trace analysis of metals and nonmetals. I've listed on the slide some of the more frequently analyzed metals and nonmetals. Atomic absorption is based fundamentally on the absorption of light by atoms or ions in the gas phase. Atoms of different elements, just as molecules do, absorb different characteristic wavelengths of light. The number of photons of light absorbed is, as in UV visible spectroscopy, proportional to the concentration of the analyte. And this gives us the basic signal and allows us to ultimately quantitate our analyte. So let's talk a bit about the process. Aqueous samples containing the analyte of interest are often aspirated into a flame. Since samples are usually liquids or solids, they have to, have to be vaporized either in a flame or another approach is to use a small tube of graphite that's referred to as a graphite furnace. Light of a specific wavelength and a specific incident intensity focused on the, on the cell uh, and then uh, the initial light intensity will of course decrease uh, based on the atom concentration that's actually present of, of that element in the cell. The intensity of the transmitted light is measured and the concentration of the analyte is determined using the beer lampert law by generating a working calibration curve by running a series of standards whose concentration encompasses the anticipated concentration range for the analyte in the sample of interest. We often call these working curves, by the way. So there's fundamentally two different sampling techniques in AA either graphite furnace AA, or GFAA, or flame AA, or that's referred to as FAAS. In graphite furnace atomic absorption, a small volume of the sample is placed in this graphite tube, and that graphite tube is then heated resistively in order to volatilize the sample. And this particular method of atomization is often referred to as electrothermal atomization. The other method involves sucking a solution um, through a small tube, a capillary, up into a flame. And we call this process aspiration. And at the end of the capillary, at its tip, that sample ends up, when it's sucked up, breaking up into a number of very tiny droplets that ultimately vaporize in the flame. And we, call, we say then at that point that the sample is nebulized. The use of graphite furnace has a number of advantages compared to the use of the flame. Um, fundamentally, a lot less sample is required to produce a signal in graphite furnace AA. In fact, as little as a few microliters are required. And that's in comparison to the typically 3 to 10 mils of solution that are required when you have flame AA. Remember that in flame AA, you have this stream of sample that has to be sucked up, aspirated into the flame. Now, in point of fact, in making a comparison, there's another important factor, and that's cost. The uh, graphite furnace instrument tends to be more expensive, as do the needed accessories, most notably the graphite tubes, which are disposable, but um, are not inexpensive. Uh, a single graphite furnace uh, costs about $30 to uh, $50. So now let's take a look at um, the basic block diagram for a, uh, for a flame AA instrument. As you can see, it consists of four basic components. 
a light source, the flame, a monochromator, and a photodetector. In flame AA, the light source is typically a hollow cathode lamp. And acetylene um, air gas mixture is often used to produce the flame. And then a monochromator is used to separate and to select the wavelengths of light, uh, which are then measured using a photomultiplier uh, or a photodiode array or charge couple detector. Same detectors as in UV Vis. And what we'll do now is we'll take a look at each element on the next several slides. So something that's new here is the hollow cathode lamp. Um, this is the standard lamp that is uh, used in atomic absorption. Uh, the lamp basically contains a pair of electrodes, a cathode and an anode. The cathode is hollow and it's cylindrical in shape. And it's typically made from the specific element of interest. So if you are measuring for lead, then the cathode would be a lead cathode. Um, the anode is typically a tungsten wire, and uh, these electrodes are sealed inside a glass envelope uh, with a low pressure of an inert gas like neon or argon. At the very end of the lamp, uh, there is a, a, a flat, optically transparent quartz plate, and that serves as the window for the emission that's going to be produced. Now the emission is produced by generating a suitable voltage difference, about 300 to 400 volts, between the cathode and anode electrodes. And the net effect is this ionizes some of the gas molecules and they strike um, the cathode, which you'll recall is made out of the element of interest, and produces excited atoms from that cathode. And these excited atoms emit light at wavelengths characteristic of the electronic transitions for that particular element as they return to the ground state. The cylindrical shape of the cathode is important and it's used to produce a focused beam of light that is then transmitted through that quartz window at the end of the lamp. So this lamp produces wavelengths of light that are characteristic of the element of interest. Now, there are two flavors of this lamp, either single element or multi-element, and these mean exactly as the term sounds. Uh, single element means whatever, what one single element you're interested in analyzing for, as versus multi-element, which would give you the ability to uh, look at several different elements uh, at the same time. Multi-elements uh, lamps are very useful, um, and uh, they are uh, relatively expensive, um, but as I said, they're very uh, useful because you can look at several wavelengths for several different elements at the same time. And that's important because it cost you have to weigh with convenience. And uh, having a lamp that can look at several different elements will minimize the need to constantly replace the lamp and recalibrate the instrument. Um, the three, I'd say, most commonly used multi-element lamps are listed here for you on this slide. And I, I've also noted for you the biggest disadvantage of the multi-element lamp, and that is that sometimes emission wavelengths for one element may overlap and therefore interfere with another element. For example, in the cobalt, chromium, copper, iron, manganese, nickel lamp, several of the manganese emission wavelengths lie near copper or chromium. In flame AA, uh, one of the most important things is properly aligning the lamp relative to the flame. This will ultimately affect your sensitivity. So we're going to take a look at that on this slide. At left, I show you the relative intensities across the profile of the flame produced and this is for a mixture of natural gas and air. And what I want you to see is that the temperature varies significantly, both as you go from side to side through the profile of the flame, as well as from the bottom of the flame to the top of the flame profile. Now, if you intend to probe different elements using a multi-element source, then 
what you're going to have to do is to realign the lamp relative to the flame as the most sensitive part of the flame for one specific element may not align with the other. And the uh, image at right sh for uh, chromium, magnesium, and silver is an effort to sort of show you this. Uh, there, uh, what, what is the best position for magnesium is not going to be um, the best position for, say, uh, chromium or for silver. <coughs> Excuse me. And this may basically makes uh, the multi-element uh, detection a, a little bit challenging. Sample preparation for flame AA is actually relatively simple, and that's because the specific chemical form of the element really doesn't matter. Atomization converts the sample into free atoms, irrespective of their initial uh, you know, chemically bonded state. And uh, one of the really cool things is that elements in biological fluids like urine and blood they, these can be tested after you uh, simply filter the solid particulates, um, which would obviously clog the, clog the nebulizer, that fine capillary, and uh, after you do suitable dilution. This slide uh, shows you what a uh, little graphite furnace a tube actually looks like. And they are little tubes, and they're hollow. Um, and you can clearly see the uh, hole, which is the injection port, and inside there's like a little ledge underneath, and that's where you will be applying the sample. Uh, microliters of the sample can be introduced via um, the injection port, and then the little furnace is heated resistively to atomize the sample inside the graphite furnace. And um, as the tube is hollow, the light from the hollow cathode lamp at one end can pass directly through the furnace and through the sample and out to the spectrometer. And this approach is really advantageous um, because you can atomize essentially 100% of the sample and this will ultimately lead to superior sensitivity for graphite furnace as compared to the flame AA technique. Now, um, the actual sample prep for a, a graphite furnace is a tad more involved, and this often involves a little bit of computer programming. The um, sample is introduced to the graphite furnace, um, and uh, you have to first um, heat the graphite furnace to remove any uh, excess solvent. And then the sample is heated to fairly high temperatures, about 1400 degrees Celsius, and that's to basically char or ash the sample. That will get rid of any volatiles, any hydroxide, sulfates, carbonates, things like that. And then, very briefly, you atomize the sample by heating it to higher temperatures, ooh, maybe as high as 2100 uh, degrees Celsius but for a short period of time, long enough for the detector signal, um, which has risen as you have started to atomize your element to then decay back to uh, baseline levels. And then the furnace needs to be cleaned so you can get rid of any uh, residue. And the way that you'll do that is uh, obviously by heating it to even higher temperatures and uh, maybe 2,500 uh, degrees Celsius for a few seconds. And then you need to cool the tube uh, so you can start the next cycle. And that will typically take less than about 20 seconds, uh, surprisingly. And the uh, point of sharing all this with you is to give you a sense of what needs to be done to prep and then actually run your sample for the graphite furnace and to make you aware that it could take as long as a minute and a half to analyze a sample uh, using this particular uh, sampling technique. All right, so now we have um, the sample has uh, been produced, um, it, uh, some of the light has uh, been absorbed, and now we need to actually measure the photons of light that have gone through the sample and separate them out into their component wavelengths. So we're going to uh, send them into a basic grading monochromator, like the one shown on this slide. Um, and you've seen this particular uh, geometry before uh, in order to um, detect um, each specific wavelength 
uh, unique and characteristic of that particular element. And how are we going to do that? Well, whoops, we're going to use either a photo multiplier or a photodiode array or charge coupled detector. And since we've discussed these photo uh, detectors in earlier podcasts, I'm not going to rehash that discussion here. Uh, PMTs are an obvious choice uh, in terms of detecting very low light levels. It's important to say a few words about sample prep peculiarities that you will no doubt encounter um, and, and why uh, you're faced with these in atomic absorption. At the outset, uh, we said that atomic absorption is a trace analytical technique. And that means you're analyzing for metals, materials at very low concentrations. And that means it's very important that you give thought to any materials, any uh, sample containers, anything that your sample might come in contact with that could possibly contaminate it uh, with, uh, the, with um, unwanted material um, and lead to an, a, an incorrect uh, result. Surprisingly, if you're talking about metal ions, um, glassware can be a very big problem. And so in atomic absorption, uh, if you do choose to use glassware, you will find that it's often uh, washed uh, with acid in order to ensure that your trace analysis isn't compromised by low levels of metals that leach from the glassware and can contaminate your sample. Uh, people often use uh, Teflon containers, uh, but of course these uh, are rather expensive. All solvents, any reagents, need to be what is referred to as trace metal grade. And lastly, uh, you need to th think about um, the cleanliness of your work area, and all containers should be kept covered at all times to prevent uh, dust from contaminating your samples. In flame AA and graphite furnace AA, uh, there's a, a, a term, characteristic concentration, that's often used, and it's uh, basically used whenever we're speaking about sensitivity. By definition, characteristic concentration is the concentration of your analyte, the element of interest, expressed in parts per million that's required to produce a, an atomic absorption signal that corresponds to um, 0.0044 absorbance units. And this value is used to predict sample absorbances for samples with specific concentrations. It's also used to uh, guide the optimization of experimental conditions when using standard assays. Now, before I close, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention two related techniques. Um, inductively coupled plasma optical emission spectrometry and inductively coupled plasma mass spectrometry. In these techniques, a plasma is used to decompose compounds and produce the atoms. Uh, you produce a plasma by wrapping a radio frequency induction coil around a quartz torch. A Tesla coil will spark argon gas and heat it to temperatures as high as 10,000 degrees Kelvin, actually ionizing the argon gas. Now, if you, in, if you introduce samples into this argon plasma, they will become atomized, and the excited singly charged atoms can be detected based on the characteristic wavelengths at which they emit. That's the basis for ICP optical emission spectroscopy. Or, alternatively, they can be separated and identified based on their mass to charge ratio. Remember I said these are singly charged um, ions, um, and that's the basis for ICP mass spectrometry. The cool thing about ICP is that no light source is required, as in atomic absorption spectrometry. And this is great because um, you've eliminated uh, one part uh, one element of the instrument. Um, it also has eliminated the problem of potential interferences that we saw in flame AA. The technique can be used to detect several elements at the same time. It has very low limited detection, parts per trillion, 
and it has an exceedingly wide dynamic range, um, can be up, upwards of eight orders of magnitude. Uh, the downside, uh, both of these techniques, ICP OES and ICP MS, they're comparatively expensive to purchase, operate, and maintain compared to uh, flame atomic absorption and graphite furnace AA. And with that, I'm going to uh, leave you with a few useful references. And I want to make a point here. You might not be aware of the large body of literature that uh, is produced by the private sector. Many of these documents that they publish freely on the uh, internet um, are, can be really ex extremely useful to you as a student and as a researcher. And the first and the uh, last references are, are good examples of uh, the types of information that you can find. The middle reference represents an example of an Environmental Protection Agency Standard Operating Protocol, or SOP. SOPs are extremely important in the uh, private sector and, and in government in ensuring quality for an analytical process by detailing the instrumentation, the equipment, the reagents, the specific experimental procedures, um, the calculations, the methods of analysis that you need to perform um, in order to obtain results of a certain quality for a specific analytical method. And the specific SOP that I'm providing here outlines how soil and sediment samples are to be analyzed for arsenic and selenium using graphite furnace AA. And I hope you'll take a look at that. At this point, before you leave the podcast, as usual, I'd like to encourage you to take a moment to pause and to review and reflect on the learning objectives on the slide. Before you leave, make sure you feel comfortable answering the following questions. Can you explain how atomic absorption works? Can you identify two sampling techniques and explain how they work and compare and contrast the two methods? Can you draw a block diagram for an atomic absorption spectrometer and explain how the instrument works? What is characteristic concentration and what's its significance in atomic absorption analysis? And lastly, do you know what ICP OES and ICP MS are? How are these two techniques different from atomic absorption spectrometry? And with that, I'll close and look forward to seeing you in the next podcast.